from Mozilla. Did you say that? We should turn on the mics. I did. Is it working? Good. 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 Um, I work for Mozilla. Um, there are a few disclaimers that we need to make. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I think that's important to say when we talk about accessibility because accessibility, obviously, a lot of people think about conformance in different countries, what are the specific requirements, um, and that's not what I do. A lot of people um, ask me questions about that, and then I send them links to legal documents that I've never been able to parse. Um, <laughs> I, again, I'm working for Mozilla. Um, we'll talk about a certain product that you might have heard of from Mozilla. I, I checked, and I don't think anybody else has really talked about Firefox OS yet. Uh, I don't open source Twitter, so I think it's a small production about that. And um, I usually, usually focus on visual impairment, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, and and it, it does branch out to other disabilities, but visual impairment is really what uh, we focus on it the day to day. Um, I apologize for that, um, and I, but I do think that you know there's, that it informs a lot of other um, issues and disabilities. Um, so back in uh, back when the iPhone first came out, um, there was no SDK. You no, know, there wasn't any such a thing as third party apps. And I think Steve Jobs probably said, if you want to make an app. Uh, for the iPhone, well, there's HTML5, the web is the platform, right? Um, and of course, that really didn't work. That um, At the end of the day, that wasn't a promise that was held. Um, if you really wanted to do the amazing things that the device, if you wanted to use the device, you know, and, and use its amazing capabilities, you really needed to go beyond HTML5, and that's when the, the native SDK came out, um, and um, and the rest is history. Today we have these siloed app stores, right? Like Apple has one, Google has another, and that's kind of like the new uh, um, gold rush that you know these companies are going for. These app stores where they get a cut, you know, out of every specific um, app that's that's in the store. Um, uh, they get to decide what what is in the store. They curate it, and that uh, obviously goes um, against you know what we believe in Mozilla when it comes to the expression of the web um, and what it really means to be a creative force. Um, so that's when we introduced Firefox OS. And Firefox OS, um, if we were to make a layered cake of what what you know this that specific platform consists of, um, there's you know the Linux operating system with uh, the kernel, obviously, with, with the system libraries, and right on top of that, we already have um, Gecko, which is our HTML uh, rendering engine. So there really isn't that much when it comes to what uh, uh, is dubbed native, right? We don't have like uh, like a Java environment, like if you're working in Android or C Sharp, if you're working in iOS, you don't have any of that. If you want to make an app, there really isn't any other choice but to use HTML. And it really does um, open up a lot of different uh, opportunities for different people. Um, this is uh, our dialer app. Um, it's running in um, in Firefox over here. You can see that um, I opened up the dev tools so I could like inspect the HTML. Um, I could look at the JavaScript and the CSS. That's all it's written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So if anybody could make a website, they can make an app for Firefox OS. And that's, you know, we're, we're here to talk about accessibility for users with disabilities, but that's a really big deal when it comes to accessibility uh, to creating, creating content on a mobile platform. Um, and our end goal is not to, like, uh, is not world domination. We don't want everybody to have a Firefox OS device in their pocket. We do want to, what we do want to do is change the conversation and uh, make it that other um, uh, vendors, such as Apple and Google, have the same extensive support when it comes to the web. Um, and the people are able to write uh, for the web and then really have it run anywhere. Um, so that's really the goal of Firefox OS. Um, we have, like I said, there, it is um, HTML5, but there are native expectations. Um, this is what you're seeing over here is me interacting um, on, on a phone. All of this is HTML, but it's not a website. We really gave it a, a slick feeling of a native application, um, and that's, of course, very important. So the keyboard is a yes. HTML. All of, yeah. All of this is HTML. Whatever you're seeing here is all HTML. So I, I guess I'm confused. What would I use it for? Android apps running? No. So so um, we kind of uh, stepped away from Android um, and or any kind of native SDK. The idea is that if you wanted to um, develop an app for it, all you would need is HTML. If you want to use the accelerometer, if you want to use GPS, if you want to do all the fancy things that that uh, are capable to do in an Android phone. 
We right now have uh, standard web APIs for them. So all those things are accessible right now through the web. And that was the real challenge that we had to rise up to. We had to have a telephone stack that's only for people that, that, that runs you know, on web and JavaScript. And those are things that we did. Um, so hopefully, of course, this is an example, but hopefully we could. Uh, yeah, most things perfect. But some things, I think of the keyboard, it's like, hey, you didn't need to do that. You could have put that as a day part, right? But the fact well, that it is means I can really change it. And yeah, but also you can write your own keyboard. Exactly, yeah, right? so it sounds pretty good. Yeah. So those are the native expectations, right? That we that you get all those transitions, you get all all that you know that that smoothness that you expect out of um, out of a phone that you don't necessarily expect out of a static website. Um, but with that comes native accessibility expectations. And I wanted to take a step back. I realize right now that I didn't really introduce uh, mobile accessibility or native mode of mobile accessibility very well, but. Um, iPhones are very popular today with visually impaired users because they are so, um, because the accessibility in them is so integrated and it is a great experience. Um, and when we have um, a phone that's based off of the web, we want them to have a similar experience. So when a blind user, for example, goes to a website, if you give them a link and it's an interesting article, they'll tell you, thank you for the link, and it's a very interesting article and they're pretty much happy because they were able to access and read it, right? But what they aren't telling you is that once the page loaded, they had to go through a bunch of lists and unlabeled images and useless link and searches and a sign-in form, and then they reached the actual article, which was then interrupted by all sorts of other random garbage. Uh, then an article, obviously, there was like some sort of like, you know, double, like, greater than signs that meant, like, continue, and they had to parse that, they had to understand what that meant. Because when you're not visual, it doesn't really make any sense. Why does it say double, greater than? Then they figured that out, they clicked it, then they read the other half of the article, and it's a great article. That is basically what, um, you know, what blind users are expecting to get over the web. And, but when they're able to accomplish it, when they're able to access that data, that's already a success in itself. But that's not good enough for what we want to do um, when it comes to a, um, a, a phone that really has that native feel and has that, uh, you know, um, that expectation. And over here, this is uh, CB Wonder, I think he's talking here at some UN Summit. And he's talking about uh, the iPhone being not just uh, you know some sort of gadget um, that some sort of like novelty gadget that, that we use every day, but but really a part of, of uh, that, that you rely on for everyday things that um, that once seemed to be impossible. And uh, and and you know when uh, all, all of those things that they that uh, that you do with that phone really need to be streamlined because you might go to a website and read an article once, but you're going to dial. People are going to text. People are going to do a lot of other core functionality phones again and again, and, we, and you can't afford to have, you know, the usual low expectations when it comes to web accessibility. So that's really what we're striving for. I'm sorry, I'm not left. Find the closet. So. Go ahead. So I was going to focus this talk specifically on visual impairment. But there are different kinds of visual impairment. Right. So are you? So was that example a blind person who couldn't see and it was being read to them? With this video but right the, now. The article they just happily read. Oh, that that was that was a fictional blind user reading an article through usually a screen reader. On, on a phone or on a device. Does that make that's, sense? That's a pretty, and it's pretty um, typical. Is it audio or is it screen reader? Okay, screen reader. no, that's a great question. And I think that, that we need to take a step back over here. And that's what I'm demonstrating over here, is you can hear, you can hear the synthesized voice explaining what's on the screen right now. I'm uh, moving my finger over the screen, and it's reading what's under, the, what's under my finger. Um, how do you tap on something? Like once you reach a button that you want, you double tap. So there's a certain level of indirection where you start uh, doing things just a bit differently than you would with a normal uh, when you're using the, the okay. iPhone. In the so we're only looking at blind people, we're not looking at color blindness, inability to see small phones, other kinds of control. Those are things that we are looking at. Yeah. But in this in this case, I was focusing on the screen. Okay, so yeah. Thanks. If if you cover that level, you usually can do the other ones a lot easier. <laughs> Yeah, which is which is kind of the, the point of like like how blindness uh, does inform other disabilities because when we talk about motor disabilities, when we talk about cognitive disabilities, 
uh, obviously, you know, different levels of visual impairment, um, all of them benefit from uh, what we get when we have a comprehensive screen reader. Um, because the, both the motor interaction changes, you can't, uh, you can't just expect people to know where something is on the screen and click it, they need to get there and then, you know, activate it, double tap it or something. Um, and, uh, and the same thing with cognitive disabilities, uh, you know, there's a text to speech, so everything is being read out. Same thing with literacy, this really helps um, in areas of literacy. So all those things are really, you know, informed by uh, blindness. Um, and I want to say a word about design, and I think that this is important. I, a few years ago, I gave a talk at Open Source Bridge about um, universal design. And a good example of universal design is that um, doorknob over there. So um, doesn't, it doesn't seem like anything special. When you look at it, you don't think motor impairment, you don't think anything else, you just see convenience. You see a leopard uh, doorknob. Um, and that's nice because it doesn't have a stigma of being there, especially for a certain population. It's useful for people who do have um, permanent impairments, but also people who have uh, temporary impairments. When carrying a box, I could open that door with my knee, um, which I couldn't be able to do if it was a round door not, which might be more aesthetic or pleasing, but that wouldn't be possible. So the really nice thing about uh, design, when we talk about that in the mobile context, is that designers understand um, in the mobile world um, that they are, that we are, we all have situational impairments. If you're um, writing an app, um, it needs to be, we need to be able to operate it in a loud environment, you need to be able to, it would be good if you could operate it when your cognitive abilities are lower, for example, if you're driving, not recommended, but that should be, you know, something that you can do. Um, and uh, you should, you know, uh, different different levels, of course, of, uh, of motor things, you know, like uh, a one-hand operation, you know, a good, a well-designed uh, mobile application will be able to be operated with one hand. Um, so those are things that are great because suddenly the um, really visually rich and complex world of the desktop suddenly is reduced into something that is a lot more easier for folks who want to make things more accessible. Accessible. Suddenly we're talking about one-column layouts, about big buttons, about um, you know uh, when we talk about contrast, for example, color contrast, uh, then, you, then it need, there needs to be a certain minimum because obviously you're going you're to look at your screen in different lights. Um, so all those are, uh, are things that, that, um, that are inherent in the design. So at Mozilla, our, our UX designers you know, wanted us to tell them about all the accessibility pitfalls. Uh, what, are the, what are the mistakes that designers make when it comes to accessibility on mobile? And to be honest, I had a really hard time coming up with a list of of things specifically for designers. If designers are doing a good job um, on mobile and, and really thinking about all the use cases um, when it comes to just regular mobile usage, it makes the life of um, everybody so much easier. Um, so some web advice in 60 seconds. Uh, what's running? Crap. Pause it. Okay, never mind. Um, I'm going to try to get as, uh, as much as much through as I can. I don't want to talk too much about the basic web. Um, web accessibility things because there are resources for it. Um, like I said, there needs to be a minimum amount of, uh, of contrast when it comes to color. You should not be using color um, to convey information. Um, you should not be using sound uh, to convey information. Those are all things that, you know, depending on some of these um, perceptibility would change, right? They wouldn't necessarily be able to use those things. We can go past this in seconds. Um, what else? Uh, keyboard access. If, if you're talking about a, a website, you know, a traditional, for a traditional desktop needs to have good keyboard access. It needs to, you need to be able to, you know, tap through all the different controls. They need to be in the correct order. The markup should be in the right order. Sometimes you see visual layouts that they try to they play around with things, but then you look at the actual markup in the code, and you know, the order doesn't make any sense. So that's very important. Um, anyone want to help me out here? Yeah, that, that's actually a critical thing because if you're doing screen reading. You gotta have all content at the front all together, you know, not punctuate by ads that are physically in there. I mean, they could visually, you know, yeah. break down if that's what you need, but um, those sorts of things, because you gotta really think of screen readers and looking at the code. Yeah. A good example of order would be um, if I have a contact form, you know, don't have the labels, first name, last name, telephone number, and then have entries, right? So somebody would go through the labels and they'd go through the entries. 
If they did it right, they'd have each uh, label associated with the length entry with the for with the for attribute in the label. But still, it's a really weird way to navigate to get to the two different uh, uh, things. Okay, so that was my advice in more than sixty seconds. Um, there's a it's, the list is a lot of conferences. Sorry. Oh, um, I, I think that, that that's an area also where things like microformats, any sort of standardized markup that mm -hmm. um, yeah, anything that makes it easier for a machine to read. A, of the structure of a page is going to make it easier for the machine to convey information to someone in a different modality. I right, guess. absolutely. So, and that actually, you hit two birds with one stone in that sense, right? Because you're also making it oh, more, um, more like searchable, right? You're you're doing some search engine optimization when it comes to uh, doing the correct title and also using um, uh, if you're using HTML5 correctly, you know, use and have use uh, header, use footer, use all those different tags correctly. Uh, you're making it so much more easier uh, for a screen reader user. And like we saw in the first in the description of that fictional user, a lot of it is getting past all that garbage. So when you have a good nav, when you have a good header, when you have like designated roles for all those things, the user will know by process of elimination where the main content is, and then they'll be able to read it. Or as we call it, the Scooby-Doo protocol. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you don't know, does that work? Like mm -hmm. you don't know, because uh, in every episode of Scooby-Doo, isn't one of them the monster, but then you don't know which one it is or something, and you do a process elimination. What that, that actually was going on for doing this for that. So, um, so, so yeah, for a more um, comprehensive list of uh, you know all the different guidelines, you should go to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, and all of them are very desktop centric, and that's why that's not what we want to talk about today. Um, native expectations. Um, so another way to do, uh, people do crazy, crazy crap today when it comes to um, uh, making their own widgets and making uh, really custom things that don't use the standard input, input elements that you have in HTML. Um, and I might decide that a div is going to uh, represent a check button a lot better than a form check button would in my app. Um, so fortunately we have what we call uh, ARIA, which is Accessible Rich Internet Applications, the why there is Web Accessibility Initiative, something like that. Um, and it's a whole list of attributes that you could tack onto elements uh, to convey to screen readers what that specific thing is. So right now, if I was, imagine that video game where I'm you know, passing my hand over the screen, if I reach a certain element that has that role, it's going to say checkbox. Even though it's not a native checkbox, it's going to say it. It's going to give the state, uh, and that's very useful. So that's one way that um, you know we take these very visually rich um, uh, applications uh, that people have find, found new and novel ways to create uh, specific controls for, and uh, and you know uh, amend it with uh, accessibility information. This is all, by the way, um, last resort. Aria, if we could, we would avoid this kind of stuff. You should be using an input checkbox and styling it. You should be doing, you know, using the tools that are there. But once you know the train left the station and there's some implementation that's out there, you know, this is the best uh, solution. So basically, going back and patching bad designs if you are done. Um, and that's what this is. There are legitimate reasons, for example, why you couldn't do a native checkbox, and then you would be using this. Sure. Uh, um, does it go beyond just you know the typical checkbox and whatnot? I'm glad you asked. So this is uh, a tree, okay? This is a tree, and you can see that um, you know it opens up. If we look at the source, the context menu isn't working. So unfortunately, we're not going to look at the source today. But all of this is uh, is uh, laced with ARIA, um, and and there's a they 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 when I do this it helps convey that it is a tree. Yeah. yeah, when I do this, uh, this this um, element will get an attribute of aria expanded, for example, and that's how um, visually you could see that it just expanded. But that's how you know uh, that information would be related semantically. Um, yeah, this is a lot more complicated. Perfect. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so that's ARIA. Um, the thing, the big problem with ARIA, or the big gap that ARIA has, is that it was written again for desktop applications. That, that's mainly what it had in mind. And when it comes to, for example, uh, navigating the tree, there are very there are certain conventions that work for desktop. Um, I don't remember specifically, but if you press Control down, you just should be moving the cursor. 
If you're pressing down, then you're moving the selection and the cursor. If you're pressing right, then you're expanding a node. If you're pressing left, you're collapsing a node. So all these things are things that kind of came up like as a convention and the way that people will right now code things um, on their websites and that works great for desktop. But we're talking about mobile, and that's a big gap that we have in mobile. Another thing is you don't see a lot of trees in mobile because this, this, term, this is a complex UI that doesn't typically exist in mobile. Uh, mobile has its own motifs, right? When we look at a phone, you don't need to like give it like a 3D thing for it to be a button. It's like obviously a rectangle that somebody's gonna like be pushing at literally as a button. So um, the uh, the roles that we that we would have for desktop don't necessarily match really very well for um, for mobile. I want to talk about the two main challenges that we have in Firefox OS um, and what we really do struggle with, and hopefully. Um, you guys can So one is um, visibility and object persistence. Uh, object persistence obviously is what babies learn when they're about a year old, that when you do this, you didn't actually go away, you're still over there. Um, the issue is that um, uh, today with all the modern new CSS, you could uh, transition something off of the screen or you could hide something behind another element and do things with uh, CSS transforms uh, that make it look as if something went away. Now, for a sighted user, it, for all purposes, did go away, right? Because because it, you don't see it anymore. But um, screen readers don't don't have a visual model of what's going on. So a, a blind user who's using a screen reader is still going to see that element just as much as if it weren't obscured. Um, and I'm going to show that in an example in a second. <laughs> Um, so, sorry. Oh, I was just wondering, is, is opacity zero equivalent to one of the two really hidden? Yes. Okay, okay that's right. right. That's yeah. It is, but it's not. Um, it isn't. Oh, it isn't. You're right. Oh, it, it isn't. isn't. Okay. We, I mean, we know that it's that it's zero. It depends, it depends on the screen reader if they show it or not. But, but it doesn't. Uh, it, I wouldn't use it. Yeah. So, so these are the methods that you have to actually hide something. Um, I'm going to leave this ability hidden in a way for a sec. Not, Talk about that in a minute. There's display none, which probably most people know. It just pretty much purges something, you know, out of the um, document and doesn't and triggers a reflow. So right. So if you have like something with a certain height, you give it a display none. You know, everything will jump to the top. Um, uh, if you want to do it in the DOM level, obviously you could programmatically remove a node. And as a last resort, you could use an ARIA standard. Again, ARIA accessible rich internet applications. A specific attribute called aria hidden. We don't like to use that for a few reasons. Um, technically, it's just very hairy because something could still receive focus but be hidden, and that's just like a really weird, um, you know, situation. But, but more principally, um, why why would you hide something from a user that another user could see? So we know there's there's a there's a strong uh, sentiment of not having that kind of segregation between different kinds of users. So if a sighted user could see something on the screen and you mark it with ARIA hidden, you're effectively hiding it from a user who's using an assistive technology like a screen reader. So that's a dilemma that I think that people should ask themselves when they design interfaces about, you know, like, am I doing a special case over here for a specific disability group? So I, am I really accounting for all those different disabilities and all those different cases when I do that? That's why we really don't like to use ARIA hidden. Um, would you suggest uh, like something for like a navigation drop-down though, like using JavaScript to toggle that? If you're toggling display none to display block, you'd also want to toggle area hidden uh, to... That's toggle. redundant and confusing. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about visibility hidden, which I actually only discovered like maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of you knew that before. It's relatively new. It doesn't take it out of the flow, right? Right. So it doesn't do a reflow. That means that like that if um, if you took a link and you give the style of aria hidden in the middle of a paragraph, the paragraph wouldn't move anywhere. Suddenly you just have like a big blank area kind of in the paragraph. Um, and that's good because it means that you're not you like you're not um, the, the graphics overhead, you know, the performance isn't, isn't yeah, necessarily as bad. And you could do really interesting things with that. So I have over here an example, a peekaboo example, because we're talking about object persistence. And you can click this. And we go through now. Um, now let's just give the hand a bit less opacity, right? Okay, so now we can actually see kind of what a screen reader sees, right? I mean, 
a screen reader would know that there is actually a, a baby face still behind there. Okay, and this is this we see this a lot in, in Gaia. I feel like I don't know like what percent of our time we're doing this, but this is like what we're primarily doing is making sure that developers who did some fancy transition that something went off stream, something got hidden, that they actually you know um, do it correctly. So you think like, oh, how do I do this? I have this transition tag, um, this transition uh, style, and you know when we do these transforms, do I right now need to add? Um, an event listener for the transition end, and, and then remove it from the uh, you know DOM, or do display none. The answer is no. You can simply do visibility hidden. So visibility. All right. Check this out. Okay, so what, what's happening over here? We have a transition. Um, it is, it is uh, the transition is all. So that means that it's transitioning all the different properties. The, the transform, obviously, the transition is 200 pixels, you know, left and right. Um, but it's smart enough to know that visibility, um, if you're hiding it, it should hide at the end of the transition. If you're showing it, it should show at the beginning of the transition. Just like you'd be writing some JavaScript. And I think I pretty much did write some JavaScript originally until I discovered this. So, so there's really no um, reason to not do this. It's a really, really simple fix. And I feel like this is what we do most of our days. Is that pretty compatible across browsers? Yes. Yeah. That, sorry, that's kind of what I meant by the drop-down menu. I wasn't uh, hiding it with display none. I was just doing opacity zero, so technically it's still there. Um, and then toggling the ARIA. OK, so get rid of the ARIA. Yeah. <laughs> And just put a visibility in yeah, right, yeah, opacity zero. Cool. Yeah. Um, there still are a bunch of challenges, and it really is like not. It's something that I think about every day, and we find <laughs> different solutions. Uh, one is modal dialogues. If you go to Flickr right now, or a few years ago, I don't know. Like like this little square shows up. The whole background dims, right? And a little square shows up and tells you to sign in. Or, something about their name interface. Um, and you see that a lot on the internet, where like everything dims and you get that little dialogue. Um, the phone obviously has its own form of modal dialogues, which kind of like, which you can still kind of see the background. There's like still, still, still some, there's some opacity style there. You can see the background, but really you're, you're focusing on, on the foreground. And that, that really is hard to um, work around, because what you need to be doing over here is giving the modal dialogue exclusive visibility. It means that you need to figure out, you know, which subtrees need to be hidden. Uh, if they're hidden and there's and they're only like vaguely hidden, like with opacity, and unfortunately there's nothing you can do. You need to use aria hidden because there's no way to hide something that's only that's partially showing. Or, you know, so that's like something that we're still struggling with. Um, I think that there should be one day like a more pre-baked modal dialogue um, that's going to come out of some standard, um, but that doesn't exist right now. Um, and fixed headers and footers. And that's kind of tough because if you have a footer or you have a header um, and the user scrolls to an item, um, the viewport is still the same size, is, is bigger than the, the visual viewport is, is like where the fixed header and footer end, right? But the actual viewport is bigger, so you're only scrolling something to the beginning of the fixed header or footer. That's also an issue with like anchor, like like j jumping to a fragment identifier. Mm -hmm. It's not an accessibility issue yeah. necessarily, but if you do that, then you know that you jump to a fragment identifier, it'll be underneath your yeah, fixed Yeah, exactly. Head. So you don't need a screen reader to, to see that, or, or just tap focus, right? Just tap around in your in your page, and you'll see that things like end up below your fixed footer. So those are things that are still annoying and are not fixed. Um, that's, that's one thing, right? Hiding things. The other thing is being proactive about showing things. So, um, oh, okay. We're going to miss a demo here, but um, you want to show a dialogue. And uh, it's not enough. I have a screen reader, unfortunately. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, I have like a screen reader on the How do 
businessness. So this is this is a screen reader emulator that we have. Um, so you can see that what's being spoken right now is a not check check button that you can't see because it's over here. It's not projected at all. Um, but if I double tap, it shows a dialog. Alright? Now all I see over here is sorry, let's do that again. I'm gonna double tap, and you can see it says unchecked, and now it says checked, right? So basically it just told me right now that we checked the screen, uh, the, the checkbox input, didn't tell it anything about there being a dialog, and that's problematic because, you know, when you're talking about screens coming and going, and you're not telling the user that something is changing, something is displayed, uh, they won't know to look for it. Um, how did I do that earlier? But if... Now I'll get that. You need to turn off the screen here. Yeah. Got it? Yep. This is the dialog, right? This is that div that I'm showing and hiding. You can see over here, uh, the visibility is hidden, right? It should be. If I give this a of dialog, I can See that the that that the cursor, the virtual cursor, jumps into the into the dialogs. That's an example of something being shown proactively, and the screen reader knows to do that because it sees that a dialog is appearing and not just some random stuff on the page. So um, that is something that people should be using if you have something coming in and out um, in your web app. So that role equals dialog is is part of HTML5. It's part of the, the ARIA standard of, that we're talking. About. So those are the ARIA standard is mostly semantic. It will mostly like tell the user what is under it. The role dialog does a nice thing, and we can, or or our screen reader is able to do extra smarts around that and see like oh, if dialog just appeared, I have to move the cursor into it and tell the user that it's there. Um, so that's something that we do especially. So that's all the showing, hiding, all of all of that stuff, which is still, you know, we're unfortunately the avant-garde over there, but we'll figure it out. Um, the other thing is input. Um, click is a challenge, and then there's everything else. Ten minutes. Um, so click works. Um, the problem with click is that you need to make sure um, that the target matches the actual element that needs to be activated. So a lot of people like to have like a uh, click listener on some parent element and have like a lot of uh, different controls or something within that element and then check what target is this and then act upon that target within, within, within that. Um, if the actual elements don't have correct roles, it's not going to work. Why? Because um, we send a click, the click will go directly to the element, it ignores, uh, it ignores the full event chain, and it's just not going to work the way that, that, uh, that it would work usually with, with, uh, with the pointer. So you make sure that, uh, that, you know, that you have correct mark, uh, RA markup, have, if it's an activatable, activatable button or whatever it is, that has the correct role on, what would actually, on the target that will actually be emitted. Um, 
And just like the uh, you know, optic persistence issue, uh, obscured things could still be clicked even though uh, mouse users can't do it and you would be worried, worried about that. Pointer events obviously is still an issue. And of course there's everything besides click when it comes to mobile uh, applications. And that could be zoom, it could be undo, redo, expand, collapse, drag, drop, and rotate, adjust value. All of those different things could have um, a specific gesture or a specific thing that would, that would work on, on, on the platform. Um, like Zoom usually is you know, pinch in and out. Uh, there needs to be a way to, um, to do that you know, in an accessible um, input agnostic fashion. Um, and there still isn't really any way to do it. The only uh, good way to do it is with uh, something that's still in a draft right now that's called NDUI. NDUI's main goal is to separate input and intent, meaning that if you uh, uh, pinched, that's, that, that was just your input. Your intent is to zoom, but, but it separates it. So the, the platform will actually interpret the pinch tester, and the user agent will fire a request to do the zoom. So those, that's the kind of separation that's going to allow us to uh, handle input in the same semantic fashion that we handle presentation. That means somebody could change what pinch means in case they're not able to do a pinch. They could say, well, if I use a... Well, they could change what, what trigger zoom. That's more that, important. That's what I mean. Yeah. You know, so they could right. rebind that. Right. Yeah. And, and, I mean, there's also a non-accessibility case here, and that is that, you know, you might have a pinch zoom web app um, that might work great on iOS, on Android. Maybe there's going to be another platform out there that that's actually not like the gesture that's used for zooming in now. Maybe they created something else. So what you want to do is you want to capture that on the platform level and send a zoom request, not actually interpret you know the zoom. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay. But we have our own little hacks that we do that you should not be doing. What we're doing right now. One of them is wheel. Uh, it's kind of like you know, the mouse wheel event, so we use that when we want to, let's say, switch pages. Uh, when we want to do some sort of like arbitrary uh, scroll, uh, we bring down the uh, notification bar, you know, in the phone with that. So that's uh, one thing that we do with wheel, and, and, and we map it for the user as like a two-finger swipe. Um, another one is arrow keys. We still use arrow keys. There is no keyboard on the phone, but we still use it because that's like the ARIA convention use arrow keys and we will still send them when somebody reaches, for example, a value, you know, changer. That's like still an evolving field that we're not really sure um, what to go with. That's it. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, your little screen reader fakery thingy, yeah. is that an easy plugin to get on Firefox? Thanks for reminding me. Because I think yes. that would be something we should all have. Uh, go to add-ons and search for screen reader simulator. Okay. And what it is, it basically activates our Firefox OS screen reader. So you're going to get exactly what people see in a device, which is pretty cool. That would be nice. Verify it. Let me just come out with detail. Yeah, question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I. When I've abandoned informant input elements, like standard HTML form input elements, often it's because of frustration that they seem to like be in their own little world where the like like for instance text text input um, it doesn't auto size to the input mm -hmm. um, and everywhere else in HTML it, it does and it's um. just like so I, if I feel like the the standard form elements are like falling behind from the rest of the HTML spec, and and so I mean this is an accessibility question exactly. Yeah, no, I agree with that sentiment. In in Firefox, you have a problem. You, you can't style checkboxes. Right, that's a big deal. Right. Um, so we have like ridiculous hacks around it. Um, the good news is, I mean, the good news is that there's ARIA, so you could always just work around it. And the better news is that Web Components is finally landing. Yeah, that's exactly um, what I was coming in to. In Firefox, yeah. and it's also available, I believe, in Chrome. It's already available, right? Um, so those are you know things that are nice. So you have like a nice encapsulated widget that just does what it's supposed to do. We don't need to think about it too much. And it'll work great on IE. And it'll work good on IE, really? Oh. Yes, of course, okay. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you could be not cynical, and I believe you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank
Thank <laughs> you.